sweet Goyle Have. Welcome back to another event at Goyle Have. This time we are here on a lunchtime talk with the wonderful Becca Parkinson from Comma Press. Uh, Becca has um, sort of she pops her head up nearly everywhere you turn <laughs> in translation. In every Zoom, you always find a Becca. Um, so I wondered if you could start with telling for people who don't know, what is Comma Press and what is your job there? Yeah, definitely. And sorry for those people who are sick of my face already. Um, so um, I'm, <laughs> Becca. <laughs> uh, I'm Becca, I'm engagement manager at Comma Press. Um, I've been there almost five years, hence why I um, I'm kind of becoming the face of Comma. Um, and yeah, Comma is a um, independent short story publisher. Um, we specialize uh, mainly in short stories, but also about half of our list is fiction and translation. Um, and we publish around 10 to 12 books a year. Um, we're very lucky to be funded by um, the Arts Council. We're a national portfolio organization um, and we're based in Manchester. Um, and yeah, we've been publishing books for over a decade, I'm going to say, because I won't say exactly how long, but, uh, but yeah, over 10 years now. Um, and we're also the convener of the um, Northern Fiction Alliance, which is a group of um, Northern independent publishing houses, um, which is growing day by day and um, sort of shouting about how brilliant Northern publishers um, and Northern independent publishers are to the world. Quite, quite. As um, sort of, you know, I, I went to university in Leeds and um, have a lot of love for the Northern Fiction Alliance. It's really, really exciting. So if people want some examples of what this kind of looks like. Um, so by short story books, we have um, the Book of series. Uh, there's my Leeds one. And then obviously these are in translation because they're Cairo and Jakarta. Um, then you also do like short story collections that are not on based on a city. Um, so this one is, do you want to explain this one? Because this one's always a good one to talk about. Yes, yes. Um, so that is from a, um, a series that we publish, which is science fiction from the Middle East. So we kind of take a um, landmark event, for example, the invasion of Iraq, or in that case with Palestine plus 100, plus 100 the Nakba, um, and we ask writers from that nation to um, imagine their country 100 years after this kind of huge event, and um, the, the result is sort of, is mixed in terms of its sci-fi, its speculative fiction, its fantasy, its bit bonkers but yeah like you say it's um it's not often you get translated um science fiction and speculative fiction particularly from the middle east where it's still quite a like burgeoning genre compared to like the west so um so yeah like like you say we have the city series in translation we have the plus 100 series in translation we do single author collections in translation as well like that one <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is this is actually a full book isn't it really so there is also a little bit of like although it'd be a novella <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So um, we've, we've published single authors like like Hassan Blassim, who's the author of The Iraqi Christ, that uh, won the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize, I think 2014. But um, I'd say on average, we publish a couple city books, maybe one genre book in translation, and then a couple single author collections a year, roughly. But, you know, depends what we're up to at the time. <laughs> Um, something that's really clear from sort of how you described it is that Compress is unlike some other publishers where you are not being pitched books because if you want a collection of uh, hundreds of um, 100 plus sci-fi stories these aren't going to be ones that are pitched to you so how do you start with the concept of a book and how do you find the stories to include? Yeah I mean it really depends on the book so for example with the Palestine plus 100 book we did a call out in Arabic and English um, and the editor Basma Gallini um, she is a brilliant Arabic translator so she kind of did, she worked on the call out and it was a case of us kind of asking for submissions for that book but also approaching certain Palestinian writers we'd worked with in the past or we'd been recommended or who were kind of already established in that genre and asking them to submit so I think Basma had a couple dozen submissions for that book which she then whittled down um, with something like um, the Reading the City series for example um, that works slightly differently in that we we often work with a co-editor so it'll often be someone from the comma team kind of working on our side and then a co-editor either based in that country or working in that language or just kind of embedded in that literary culture or that scene 
um, we will work with them and they will kind of pitch us a list of writers or again we can pick from writers we've worked with in the past if they're based in that city um, and it's a case of either finding a story that they've written about the city or sometimes we will say please will you write us a new story um, like you say we don't really work on submissions like we don't have an open submissions box like a lot of independent publishers we tend to say that we work on a commission basis so like you say it's about the idea so um, so rather the publisher will have some wacky amazing idea for a book and it's a case of us going out and finding the authors finding the translators or hoping they find us maybe um sometimes if it's a bit if it's a bit niche like palestinian science fiction <laughs> um, so do you know how ra picks books or is that sort of you know is it is it uh because i don't think it's random is all i'm gonna say like no is, no very much intentionality in the diversity that you guys cover yeah i mean often with Ra's commissioning and with our publishing it's very much like led by contemporary issues so like for example um, in 2018 we published a book in translation called Banthology um, which you may be familiar with and um, that book was literally literally commissioned in response to Trump's travel ban so we were all sat around having a meeting we got like the BBC news notification on our phone saying like Trump has banned these seven Muslim majority countries from entering the US and we were all just so horrified plus the fact that it has an impact on the writers we published from the Middle East you know who want to travel to the US um, so we literally decided in that meeting, right, we're going to publish this book. And within nine months, we'd commissioned the stories, translated them, published the book. Um, I think in time for Trump's, I think in, I think a year after the ban had been put in, but I might be wrong on that. But but yeah, do you know what I mean? So so the commissions very much come from a place like a reactionary place sometimes. Um, I know with the with the science fiction. It was something that he and Hassan, who's the editor of Iraq Plus 100, had discussed in the in the past, the kind of untapped potential of genre fiction from that kind of part of the world. And um, and they very much wanted to showcase all this amazing writing, which wasn't available in English, sadly. Um, so, yeah, it very much comes from from somewhere in Ra's brain, um, but also, you know, the news, the headlines, the discussion points, the zeitgeist. Um, you know, I would never say we're a trend publisher. We don't follow the kind of trends that major mainstream publishers do. We kind of, and that's a great thing about being an independent and being, um, you know, a small press is we can pivot and change and, and respond to those issues relatively quickly. Um, you know, give us nine months and uh, and we'll have a book, fingers crossed. And, and, and I think you can, you, like you say, you can see that there is a purpose. It isn't all random. And, and some of it comes from our readers as well. We do, we do ask our readers, you know, what do you want to see? And sometimes they'll have a really great idea and we'll just go with that. <laughs> yeah, I saw you did that literally just the other day from recording. Yeah. Um, so from a reading experience, what I was sort of feel very strongly about Comet is that um, the story might not be the best written thing that you have ever come across. Like that is not what you guys exist to do. And um, you do exist to be the first <laughs> or to facilitate um somebody's first story their first translation um that they are going to get published like you know even in sort of things like the book of leads you know these aren't going to be writers who you will find in waterstones in any on the other shelf oh hey there i gave a shout out <laughs> <laughs> um, in any bookshop well your independent bookshops you are more likely to find um a more diverse range because of the nature of things so um sort of how does that work for sort of choosing the translators and from sort of um, the writer's perspective as well, sort of what does that sort of relationship look like, translator, writer, comma? Yeah, I mean, as well as being a publisher, we, we, we sort of try to act like a writer development agency or a translator development agency. And that's definitely grown as part of our remit over the years. Um, I mean, in terms of the writer thing, like you say, with our anthologies, you know, we don't just want it to be 10 people you've already heard of, you know, uh, with like Hilary Mantel, Margaret Atwood, whatever, 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 you know, you've read those guys, you, you know that they're brilliant. Um, and it's, it's about either showcasing new writing entirely or mixing in new writers with the more established writers, as you say. Um, you know, it's always a really big honor and a, and a privilege for us to be like the first publisher of an author, you know, even if they go on and, and they're published somewhere else, like, 
it's nice to give someone that start and it's the same with translators like we'll often work with um, emerging translators on their on their first publication we've worked with um, the University of Bristol um, on their they have like summer schools for emerging translators and we'll often have people from those sort of things come through to us and from our short story courses who were then published in our anthology so it's like um I don't want to say ecosystem because that sounds really like like I think we're the best but we're, we're not definitely but um I, I like to think that you can see with us a writer who's maybe come through a course or come through um, working with us on a on a single story who's come through multiple anthologies who we then publish for like a, a single author collection and you can kind of see how we've worked with them and developed them rather than just kind of going like oh yeah we'll publish your entire short story collection out of nothing um, you'll see that with a lot of our writers Hassan Blassim you know now an award-winning worldwide name you know we we first published him I think in 2008 in a city anthology we then published a single author collection then he won the independent foreign fiction prize last year we published his debut novel you know there's a there's a journey even though I hate using that word there is a journey for writers and translators with us and I like to think that we nurture and support them in, in lots of different ways um and like I say, if they if they stick around, awesome. If they go on to bigger and better things, even better, because we just want to shout about their success. The, and it's what everyone says, right? If you talk to a writer or translator, the first step is the hardest because nobody will take you on unless you have already been published. And if you can't get published, well, then how are you going to ever be published? To, you know, I know it's a vicious circle and, and everyone in the industry knows it. And that's why we have um events for you know we, we have a, a writers conference for um emerging writers we have a translation conference for emerging translators we now have a publishing conference for emerging publishers because we know that that first step into the industry we want to open that door we want to make the industry accessible and inclusive and if we can play a part in that amazing um and you know like i just said i like to think that we play some part in a writer's or translator's or publisher's journey, um, even if it's just the first step, then then hopefully we've done some good and kind of fed, um, I don't know. I think there is an appetite in the industry, but I don't think there's a lot of gateways. So I think it, it feels quite important, like an important part of our work to be that gateway. And the gateways are also crashed in that it is an industry that people really want to work in. And so that means that those gateways are like everyone's trying to get through and also yeah, <laughs> and, and then that allow uh, the the situation that's been created especially by the big publishers is that then they don't adequately reward people for the work that they are doing and then those gateways get a little bit smaller because there's a whole bunch of people who can't try yeah. Um, so I wanted to come on to this advocacy because it is a unique part of Commerce work. Um, you know, you do so much with events, um, Manchester in Translation, um, the National Creative Writing Industry Day. Had to make sure I got that right. <laughs> um, and like, you know, I see so much work that you do, particularly for industry focus. So how does that fit in with you guys as a team? Like, how do you split the work up? And like those um, obviously take time to do as well. <laughs> Yes, um, you know, people are often surprised there are four of us in the comma team um, and we also publish books as well as doing all of this kind of advocacy outreach sort of thing. Um, we're very lucky that we have really talented people in our team. So my colleague Sarah Cleave is the kind of brain behind our translation initiatives. You know, she she kind of spearheaded Manchester in translation and she's now um, working on a collaboration between ourselves and the Stevens Fender Trust um, to train um, translators in schools. <laughs> also at the festival, can't catch Stephen Spender Trust. Yes, please tune into that and find out more about those sessions because they'll be great. Um, and then I'm very lucky on the other side to have my colleague Zoe who runs our publishing conference and our National Creative Writing Industry Day slash conference. Um, I still call it the Graduate Fair, which is what it was called four years ago when I get shouted at. Um, but yeah, I'm just very lucky and, and we just have to be very clever with our time, you know. Um, we, we do, as you'll see, we space the conferences out and that's on purpose to kind of allow us to prepare, deliver, and then kind of recoup and get feedback and improve for the next year, hopefully. Um, you know, things like the creative writing conference, I think this year will be the 
fifth year or maybe sixth year I might be wrong um and fingers crossed if people have kind of come to it every year they'll see it improving they'll see our lineup becoming more diverse they'll see we're offering more hopefully um and I hope Manchester and Translation and the publishing conference will will do that as well but yeah I mean it's not it's not without its difficulty it's incredibly difficult to to publish as many books as we do and deliver as much as we do with the size team that we have we're very lucky that we're often supported by brilliant paid interns um and external partners whether it's a festival or a venue or, or you know manchester metropolitan university is our partner on um, a lot of our conferences and they um, provide a massive amount of support as well as all the authors and agents and editors and people who give up their time to speak at these events um you know we had i think a dozen industry professionals speaking at our publishing conference last month, giving up their time and, and wisdom um, to speak to about 100 aspiring publishers over Zoom, you know, and we've all got a bit of Zoom fatigue at this point, I'm sure. But I think, you know, like we were just saying with the kind of gateway thing, it's really important, I think, as people in the industry to kind of share that that insight and that wisdom with with people who aren't. And, um, and yeah, <laughs> when I think about like having to plan another conference now, I'm just a bit like, oh no, but I know it will be worth it when I, we know we get the great feedback and we see, hopefully in November when we host this year's writing conference, maybe it'll be it partly in person and I'll be able to see another human. That'd be nice, but um, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Oh, I'll tell you what, I'm always impressed by the amount of work Comer puts out. I think it is quite astonishing. Oh, thank you. Not, <laughs> not least, like things like your newsletter will just be so full. <laughs> you know, it's That's like, me. <laughs> <laughs> it's always, you always know it's a Becca email because it's come back in about five minutes. And it's, you know, it's the most impressive thing. Oh, gosh. Don't, I'm blushing. No, I love doing the newsletter because. I just love shouting about what we do. You kind of, I think sometimes you can become a bit jaded and you forget until you kind of put it all together into a report or a newsletter and then you're like, oh no, we're doing okay this week. Even if I've had a like small mental breakdown, but, um, and, and shouting about what other people in the industry are doing as well, like other publishers and festivals like this, you know, there's a, there's a lot of great stuff going on no matter what you're interested in. And, I, and that's the great thing about this kind of virtual, Sphere is, you know, I, I've never gone to more literature festivals in my life because I I can just sit at home and watch these incredible events <laughs> in my pyjamas. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the big conversation around them has been accessibility as yeah. well. Yeah. Like, you know, the, um, they, they, they are an incredibly inaccessible thing when all in one place. Yes, definitely. Yeah, no, it's, it, that's a big thing with our conferences is when they're in person, we want them to be accessible physically in terms of the venue, but also when they're virtual or in person, we want them to be accessible. So, so that's why we do things like sponsored tickets and bursaries and, um, you know, we're trying to remove those barriers to entry, which I think can be really exclusive, exclusory is, I think is how you pronounce it. But, um, you know, I, I I, I, we're, we're a team of you know white mainly middle class publishers and I think we have to kind of acknowledge that privilege and not forget that there are people who aren't in this privileged position as us or me in particular so yeah accessibility is a huge issue in publishing at the moment um, and there's a lot of people writing about it in a much more eloquent way than me and making amazing reports so um, yeah I'm sure there's lots of great reading material out there that's not <laughs> that's not produced by comma but yeah um so getting sort of back to like the the, the process of how you publish a book yes. we're actually quite curious about how does um a book get copy edited edited and then eventually how does it become a physical book um what sort of for the print and ink fans out there like what papers do you use you know not exactly but you know how how does that look for you guys yeah um, no one's ever asked me about the production side of our books um I don't think ever um I mean it's a fairly lo-fi process with comma um we receive the stories um, usually in Word documents, we'll do an initial proof or copy edit or line edit. Um, usually one person in the team is kind of assigned to do that first main like dissection, I suppose, of the text. And then once they're fairly happy with it, my colleague Sarah will um, typeset it. Um, and we have a kind of standard template. If you've looked at any of our books, you'll kind of recognize the kind of style that we use. Um, 
And then once it's in a PDF format, every member of the team will read it. Um, we want as many eyes on it as possible and we, we do all of it in-house. Um, so, so it's got four pairs of eyes checking it at that point. So fingers crossed we get most of the um, errors. Then obviously the authors will have another look before we send it to print. Um, you know, we, I'm trying to think what, what people might want to know about print, printing and things. I mean, we print on white paper. I think that's quite unusual, um, uh, but it's all sustainable paper because I think that's important. Um, we, our, our cover designs are normally, 90% of the covers are done by a guy called Dave Eckersall, who's incredible. Um, and he does it like in his free time. I think he's in his full-time job is not being a designer, which you wouldn't believe looking, he does all the city series, all of the plus 100. Um, the city ones are my favorites, I think. Like, I don't know if people can see very well, but I'll put, probably put a photo up as well. But yeah. it's all those outlines of the like core buildings. They yeah. get me every time. They're incredibly detailed. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. definitely worth like taking a closer look at some of them and you'll spot little like, not Easter eggs, but like little statues or like, and, and the thing with those covers is, um, so for example, um, with the Jakarta one, it was a case of me speaking to the editors and going on Google and looking up landmarks and then collecting reference images. And then I sent them to the cover designer and he'll try and put them in, in a sort of jigsaw of beautiful objects. I mean, you'll, if you live in Jakarta or Riga or any of these countries, you'll notice they're not to scale and they're not like geographically correct. Like, um, like the Venice cover that we've just done, like those two bridges are not next to each other, but we're just trying to give you a kind of essence of the kind of, landmarks and kind of recognizable features of that city um and they're all they're so beautiful i mean you only have to look at a picture of them all together um and the ones that sell the best are ones like tokyo where it's got the beautiful like cherry blossom cover um that's that, that we get that one on instagram a lot um, <laughs> and I, I think like beautiful covers are important obviously um and then to go back to the process um we send them to print most of our books are printed by clays um who are down in Suffolk, I think. Um, and then most of the books go to our distributor, which is Ingram, but um, some of them come up to Manchester and are sent out to people who've bought them from our website. They're sent out to press, they're sent out to bloggers and Instagrammers and lovely people. Um, yeah, have I missed any? any no, I think those, those are sort of the key things I was definitely after because I always like knowing where it's printed and, you know, I, I think that's great and it's also like so a surprising number of the independent publishers do all print in the UK and I think that's just great yeah no we've always printed in the UK our books are um, our warehouse is based in the UK I think in Milton Keynes um, we do have a distributor in North America that's like print on demand but if you order a book from anywhere in the world except North America it will come from the UK which is obviously quite tricky at the moment in light of certain yeah. political decisions but um <laughs> You know we're doing our best if if you order a book from our website it is hand packaged by the publisher and sent out from a post office somewhere in south manchester so you know you're getting the the indie touch <laughs> <laughs> oh absolutely i love when you like i don't think homer is quite handwritten but there are a few indie publishers out there where you get something through the mail and it's been handwritten and you're like oh handwritten was a lot easier when we were in our office like because i used to love doing handwritten like postcards and things but if I, I like we're still home based at the moment so if I was to kind of turn up at my boss's house and be like I'm just gonna hand write a few of these for you I don't know like how well that would go down but hopefully a return to postcards and handwritten little touches when we um fingers crossed return to our office at some point this year <laughs> So you mentioned the book of Venice and then yes. also the book of Ramallah has been yes. recent um, and sort of do you want to sort of talk about like um, oh actually do I want to touch on the Northern Fiction Alliance first before we go into recent projects and then yes. end the next projects let's yes. talk about the Northern Fiction Alliance. Yes please. Tell me um, so well, I happen to know but tell everyone who doesn't know what the Northern Fiction Alliance is who you guys started with and then the amazing publishers that are now all part of it. Yeah, so the Northern Fiction Alliance started as a kind of idea, I want to say 2018, although time has flown, so maybe, I think it was 2018, 2017, so some, sometime around yeah. then, um, and it was initially just four publishers, which was ourselves, um, Dead Ink, 
Blue Moose and People Tree, I think, was the yeah. original lineup. Oh my God, this is such a test. Um, and <laughs> I, uh, I think actually maybe Blue Moose came in in the second round. So it might have been under the stories and then Blue Moose. Yes. But yeah, basically there were maybe yeah. half a dozen of us kind of. Um, and what we did was we got a an international showcasing grant from the Arts Council, which basically meant that we we all teamed up. We had a joint rights catalogue. So we went to book trade fairs, um, which if people don't know is where publishers all meet up and um, sell rights or buy rights to each other's books so you can publish them in that language. So we got this money from the Arts Council and it allowed the four core publishers to go to, I think it was London, Frankfurt and Book Expo in America, which is now I think defunct, but um, they're kind of the three main like Western trade book fairs. Um, and that was a massive success, you know, the kind of combined power to kind of have a stand, which is something I think most indies can't afford on their own, have catalogs printed with like beautiful logos and covers and graphics. Again, something most indies can't do on their own. Um, it was such a success that we kind of decided to to grow it and it wasn't just a success like in terms of monetary value it was also the kind of public support that we received I think there was kind of a a void where there was lots of people who wanted to know about northern publishing who were interested in it in terms of either careers or in terms of the books that we published and we, we just kind of said oh we're these northern publishers in this big group and all of a sudden you know, there was there were hashtags. We were having people contact us wanting to do events, um, and it, and it kind of just grew organically into this amazing project. So, like I say, we've added more publishers. We've got a bit more funding from the Arts Council. Um, we've done a few more book fairs. We've done some events. We've done some road shows, which is where we kind of take over a bookshop for the evening and all talk about what we're publishing and have some authors read. Um, those have gone really well. Um, it's something that we really want to grow in the future in terms of size, but also in terms of what we're able to offer. So, so recently we've been offering kind of um, workshops for the publishers so that there's kind of a kind of skills um, based part for the people in the Alliance. Like we want people to feel like they're, they're getting something out of it other than just kind of like um, the, the kind of public support, which is, which is amazing, but I think it's really important, especially in publishing, to kind of always have that kind of continued development, especially for people who are maybe mid-career or late-career publishers, because um, the industry is constantly changing. Um, it's very hard to keep up. But but yeah, it's been it's been an amazing thing to to be a part of. We've we've just this year um, launched the the next round of our mentoring scheme. So that's pairing um, young or kind of mid-career publishers from the northern presses with kind of more established, renowned, experienced publishers uh, from publishers across the UK, not just the North. But um, yeah, I love working on anything NFA, to be honest. I can't wait till we can do more road shows and more events and and maybe go to a book fair because there haven't been many of those the last year or so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think like, you know, the, the uh, it's a conversation that um, people within the industry might be very familiar with, but if you're not, um, the move to get publishing out of London is um, growing momentum every year, and the more the better, um, because it doesn't need to be in London. No, I, I, I'm a big advocate for for publishing decentralising, and, and, and it's the, NF, the NFA kind of was born out of an open letter that we published to the London-centric publishing industry. I think you can still find it online, but it basically said, you know, enough is enough. There's no need for this. And I think that's something that the pandemic's accelerated massively. Um, we were talking before this about silver linings, weren't we? And one of them has definitely been, hopefully, a kind of drive for remote work. And, you know, a lot of publishers in the last couple of years have, have announced these regional or satellite offices and hubs like Hachette and Harper North. And, and it's amazing to see, you know, I'm a, I've always wanted to be in publishing. I, I went to uni in the Northwest and, I want, you know, as, a, as an undergraduate wanting to enter publishing, I was told you'll have to go to London, yeah. you'll have to sleep on someone's sofa, you'll probably be miserable for a few years, and then maybe if you're lucky, you might get to come back to the north. And that's, that's a horrible thing to hear when you're a teenager. So, you know, I've been very blessed to get this role and, and be able to stay in the northwest and work in publishing, but, you know, not everyone is that lucky. And I think it's, it's time that there wasn't this talent drain of just people having to go down to London even if they don't want to. I mean, some people will want to because London's a brilliant city, but some people like me are homebirds and would very much like to stay 
you know, in the Northwest. So, so fingers crossed, you know, the silver lining of this whole year is that um, maybe we'll see more offices in Manchester and Leeds and Sheffield and York and, and other places. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, Venice, Ramallah, yes. um, sort of these are your couple of most recent books and what's coming up so how have you enjoyed working on those um you know I know you're not going to say you hate them <laughs> but what's coming up next for you guys as a publisher as well yeah I mean it's been a tricky year like normally we would have published a couple more books than we would have by now but we've been kind of hit by um production delays relating to covid and uh, distribution trickiness um hence why we're only on book two in may um but yeah venice will be coming very soon and um another beautiful cover by dave so i hope everyone enjoys that it's quite different for a city anthology i will say like reading it it's very much focused on the venice of the now and how it's been affected by um the climate crisis and covid and you know it feels very very contemporary so i think if you're kind of wanting a kind of idea of what venice is like right now this second you will love that book um in terms of what's coming up, uh, we have um, two new city books coming out later this year. Um, the Book of Reykjavik, which I'm co-editing, and the Book of Barcelona, which my colleague Zoe's co-editing. Um, and I hope they will be great. Um, I, I've just um, finished typesetting Reykjavik. And I mean, I'm biased, but I think it's lovely. And the stories are great. And it's got a really... Um, interesting mix of authors in it so um and I'm hoping to go to Reykjavik later this year and talk about it so fingers crossed everyone for me um other than city books um we are doing another plus 100 book we're doing um Kurdistan plus 100 and um, that will be out later in the summer um and we're going to do a bunch of events around that around um Kumanji translation which if anyone's interested in a very um, underrepresented language in translation then please um, stay tuned sign up to the newsletter um, and then what else are we doing we're doing an anthology um, over the summer that's going to be a giant hardback beast of a book about American foreign policy and their interventions on uh, foreign soil and how America's basically intervened when it shouldn't have in a lot of cases um what, what? who knew um who knew? but i mean a lot of the those the things in the book i'd never heard of and when you google them they are horrifying um i mean some of the things i can think of off the top of my head there's a story written by hassan blassim about abu Ghraib pr prison and the kind of torture techniques used on prisoners there there's one about mk ultra um, there's one about um, the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. And I mean, and, and it's really interesting because um, there is a lot in translation. We've published um, authors in translation in that anthology from, from so many different territories. Um, there's 20 stories and 20 afterwards. And then I think there's about 15 different translators. So overall, it's a beast of a book. But I think if you've enjoyed our kind of history and fiction anthologies like Protest and Resist before, and you're wanting to kind of see a kind of American anthology, then then you look out for that because um, that'll be coming very soon. Um, and I think that's it. I'm just trying to think now. No, I think I think that's mostly it. We might have a British single author collection out towards the end of the year, but that's not been announced yet. But yeah, if you're if you're wanting to stay in the loop, then then do follow us on, on social media because I'll be there tweeting away. Um, <laughs> lots of translation coming this year, so it's very exciting. Fantastic. And thank you so much for all the work you do in the industry. You know, it helps me. <laughs> like, you know, very literally, um, you can count on Comma to, um, you know, produce resources that I enjoy and that also um, to find those translators and authors and to give them a voice um, that I might not have heard. Um, you guys are a great resource for that. Oh, thank you. That's really kind. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm a massive supporter and fan of any kind of festival or event that like gives a platform to translated literature and translators themselves so I think what you're doing is incredible so so yeah thank you I was already praising how amazing this program is before we started so go and watch more of these talks and discussions and panels and and make sure you watch Aaron Arba Sinner's um talk as well because that will be great yeah it will and that's in joint partnership because it's yeah with Comma Press so that's really good <laughs>
<laughs> um, thank you, Becca. Thank um, you. Really appreciate it. Um, if you want more of Goyle Half, you can find the rest of it on our YouTube and um, just search Goyle Half. Um, our website, we have a Patreon if anyone has the ability to give any money um, and uh, sort of, you know, help us pay for the Zoom license and that kind of thing. Um, so um, thank you very much and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> thank you, Becca. Thank you so much.